Carson Keith is going to be our moderator this evening. Carson is a curatorial assistant at the High Museum of Art and was a guest curator for this show, Women to Watch. So Carson, um, thank you for doing this tonight and we're excited to have you. And to introduce our, we have four of our five artists here this evening, which we're super excited about. Uh, so we will start with Lucia Rodriguez. Um, and ladies, I think you can sit here and Carson here. Uh, Whitney Stanza, Sanaz Hagani and Jerusha Graham. Um, I don't know how this works. I guess we just get started. Are you missing a microphone, Whitney? Sarah, did you take a microphone? Sorry, ladies. Thank you. I wanted to say thank you to, to Jean and Sarah and Lisa Taylor. I don't know if she's in the room. Um, they've been extremely helpful and very generous to all of us while we're kind of bumbling through. <laughs> um, ladies, I think typically at Artist Talks, the curator kind of talks through everyone's practice, but I think you can do it much more beautifully than I can. For example, Lucha, I was watching your video back. We have videos on each artist that we filmed throughout this process, and you were saying you were creating little light traps throughout your work, which I think is such a beautiful way to talk about your work, which is just directly behind us. Um, let me say too, if at any point anyone's confused as to whose work is whose, please speak up, we'll let you know. We'll do a little Vanna White pointing. So, hello. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, so, I've been working with paper for a really long time. First, I got introduced to it just by experimenting. As a kid, I couldn't get my hands off of it. And I would just tear it and make doodles and everything. And then I studied graphic design. So, I started just making packages and really minimal designs because I was more interested in leaving the page white. And that's how I got interested in printmaking, that it was more about really thinking about different techniques that will help me put ink over surface. And then that way I could manipulate paper any way I wanted to, not only to create a spread or magazine, whatever, but it was more sort of like this artistic expression that I discovered through paper and printmaking. And this body of work, these, I call them knife drawings, actually, because I was looking at the paper as a whole. I wanted to make something out of paper in terms of hierarchy. The lines are made with the paper, and somehow the paper is also controlling the shades of the colors, too. And it was just a matter of defining, again, what a line was. And for these knife drawings, it was making incisions into the paper. And then the line started forming with two cuts and the shadow. And then that starts a line. So it was just questioning what paper could do. And I'm really excited to have this body of work, you know, after four years of thinking what paper could do on its own, really. I was saying, or asking rather, if you could kind of explain, kind of in brief, just what your work is about, or kind of like your baseline for when you're making work. There we go. Um, so my name's Whitney Stancil, and um, thank you guys so much for being here. Hey, Lucinda. Um, so that's a great question. The question is, what is my work about, or the sort of yeah, conceptual nature? Yeah, I mean, obviously, nature? we will get into it yeah. as we keep going throughout yeah. the talk, but kind of conceptually, like, what was your starting line? Um, I also, like Lucha, from a very young age, um, love to draw, and I think that we can all connect with, that we use paper on, a, on an everyday basis, and um, so 
paper for me is sort of the beginning of all things in terms of just jotting down ideas, sketching ideas. Um, in 2007, I um, started uh, getting my MFA from SCAD. And um, at that time, I sort of questioned, what do you want to make work about that is really meaningful to you? And we had moved to College Park and um, live in this old home. Um, we're the second owners of a home that was built in the 1920s. And um, there's such a sense of place and history in College Park. We were really lucky to um, spend a summer painting the interior of Jane Willingham's home. And she followed us from room to room, just telling us stories of College Park. And she was the first woman on the radio in Atlanta. And so she was just such an inspiring and interesting person. But I found myself being really interested in place and um, wanting to explore the history of my mother's childhood, which is often what my work is about. Um, the idea of the absent center and um, so, yeah, if that answers. That was question. perfect. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sanaz Hagani. I am originally from Iran, and I am a visual artist that live in Athens, Georgia. My, um, I studied printmaking and book arts, and so paper became my, became my like, um, favorite things because it's um, accessible, it's lightweighted, and as a printmaker, it uh, observed the ink really good, so I fall in love with it. And, the, and then I learned to make the handmade paper, so, and I realized that now I can choose the material, the fiber of the paper, and then I loved it more. And um, my works are about uh, women's situation in Iran. And I try, through my works, I try to tell different stories of uh, women's situation in Iran. Hi, I'm Jerusha Graham. And um, my. I guess in terms of the paper cutting that you see here in this show, actually started from um, a children's book. I love the snowy day. And um, just the really simple, clean lines that he was using in that, I wanted to experiment with that. So I did a series of paper cuts just playing in my studio, and that was in like 2005, 2004. And from those little cuts, I kept experimenting, and it eventually grew into the, um, the larger cuts and, and developed into um, imagery that focused on, or focuses on um, the um, groups within our society, the smaller groups within our society that contribute and, and really make our, our communities richer and deeper. Like the work basically is about empathy, thinking about how can I relate to um, a person or a group of people that um, at first I feel like I may be different from, or you may be part of that group. And um, you know, how, how do I embrace being part of a group that is considered outside or in the undercurrents. Or like the feeling of the other, kind yes. of. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Whitney, you touched on it briefly, but I think certainly for me, when I was in art school, because I have a BFA, um, I think it was really important to a lot of my professors that paper kind of acts as a means to an end, whether you're doing sketches or mock-ups. And I'm interested if any of you, while you were getting closer and closer to kinds of synthesizing what's important to you in your craft, if you kind of wrestled with working with paper, if you were told, like, move on, do something different, maybe move to wood or something along those lines, um, and if it took you any time to really settle in to, like, this being your body of work. Um, 
Well, I was sort of lucky that while I was at SCAD, um, my husband Micah was at Georgia State, and so we sort of joked that we got the best MFA that Atlanta had to offer. <laughs> um, and Lucha and I were actually in school at the same time, and it was not uh, uncommon at two o'clock in the morning to walk into the printmaking studio, and Lucha would be there, and we would just kind of give each other a look like, yep, yeah, I'm still working, you're still working. Um, I think that, um, I felt really uh, encouraged at SCAD to try lots of things. I remember I took a sculpture class with Susan Krauss and I made these garments out of paper, which I made those garments and then I made the dress out of paper and she was super encouraging. Um, I think that, um, that there is a, a time where you are uh, wrestling in the studio with yourself. I, I definitely know with, I teach and with my students I say, you should be making a lot of mistakes and there should be a lot of failures happening because if that is the case then you're actually pushing yourself um, to expand your 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 language um, your artistic language and so um, there is definitely a sense of with the paper sort of wondering like what can it do um, and there's a sense of fun with that but there's also a sense of um, just being almost like afraid but I think that that's maybe a good place to be because um, you're sort of trying new things and um, to me I've tried so many different things it's just what the idea needed at the time I've used plexiglass and um, I would do screen printing on top of plexiglass. I would dye plastic tubes with hair dye. I would use gel, just anything, fabrics. I made a giant plush one time and recorded without just using my body without any sort of instruments around me and explore that too. And I don't think I would have been able to view paper the way I do if I hadn't gone through so many different materials. Even with printmaking, you get the chance to work with wood, with copper, and I think right now the technique that I develop is sort of like this mesh of doing printmaking without a plate, without, without carving the wood, but doing everything with the paper. So I think it's important to just explore and whatever you feel like you need to get your hands on to represent your idea better than you should do it. Um, I tried different material, like Lucha said, like I, um, as a printmaker, I printed on fabric, I printed on, um, like mylar, plastic, and then I realized that my favorite medium is paper. Um, I like the texture, I like the, the thickness because they have like different thickness. You can have really thin, thin paper or you can choose or make a really thick paper. So all of these choices like um, made me to like uh, work with it and especially about handmade papers there are like thousand different ways and different materials that you can make your own paper you can choose your own material and you can put something so personal use something so personal and make a paper with it and it's like uh, and I think um, it can become even the uh, simple sheet of paper with that personal thing can become a piece of art or piece of work. So uh, my background is also in uh, printmaking and uh, fabric design and I don't Maybe being in those two areas, there wasn't a real stigma about working in paper. I mean, both of those uh, groups, and you go to conferences and things, printmaking being an uh, applied art, or, uh, you know, coming from more of the commercial, like printing and then 
artists got a hold of it and start doing pushing and doing other things and fibers um, that constantly is it fine art or is it craft you know those conversations are always happening so I think um, for anyone that's going into those areas you already are in the mindset that um, I love the material or the process or the technique and I'll let someone else figure out what category they want to put it in you know I don't see that there's a stigma um, if I'm making something that's utilitarian and it's beautifully done um, some people just use it and enjoy having beauty around them in a usable way and other folks will you know take it and put it in a shadow box or a case or a wall uh, on their wall and um, enjoy it in that way so you know whenever I got started working in in paper it wasn't so much thinking um, will it be taken seriously it was just a, a curiosity like everyone here said like what can I do with this how can I um, achieve what I'm striving for in my case trying to whittle things down and keep it simple I think I can complicate things a lot and working in this medium helps me um, edit I'm glad you brought up the concept of kind of capital A art versus capital C craft um, I think that's a really gendered conversation I think so often if you are in the world of craft whoever puts you there frequently it is gendered and people kind of assume that you're a maker not an artist you identify that way um, this is really broad but I am interested as how gender plays a role in each of your practices and if you feel that it's kind of pushed you in one way or the other material wise where your work has been shown representation things along those lines and I think it's important too that this award is all women and kind of there's always the phrase that anonymous was a woman and especially in works of paper and of textile so often is it kind of unidentified artist or maker once known and it's just exciting that we kind of are moving forward and get to put faces to names but even still it's it's hard out there for ladies Well, it's always an honor to be represented. And for me, it's not only being a female presenting artist, but also being, you know, from the Latinx community, which is another thing, too. We always want to have more diversity everywhere. The shows that I've had here haven't been, you know, you ha don't see that many Latinx people. So, it's a balance that we are always struggling with um, because you do want to see the true face of the cultural landscape, what, what's Elena, and the only way to know it's to include people however they want to identify themselves. If you really want to understand culture, you have to see what everyone has to say. And in some instances, you are sort of welcomed into the space but there are certain things you can't really talk about and that's all something that we can also work on you know with galleries with museums and really having these tough conversations that um, that most people just avoid you know um, like everything's fine everyone's represented when the re reality is not and um, I'm also excited that the next show is going to be about Latinx so <laughs> that's another um, step forward um, into really being more open and also with shows like this it's the power of them, it's coming here and not thinking about one artist, one work, but actually these are all women artists. What are they thinking about? Because art starts from questioning. What are these women artists questioning? And be part of that and try to understand what's happening. Hot potato, who wants it? <laughs> um, 
I, I mean, I do think that uh, being a woman is, or um, I mean, it's a big part of my identity, but when I'm making my work, I'm not necessarily like, what am I saying for women artists around, the, you know? Uh, let me uh, make a statement for yeah. women, all women, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not necessarily, like I can't, I don't necessarily point to it and say, I'm making a statement about, uh, specifically about being a woman, but I do find that I, most of the figures that I draw, and, I'm, and I'm a, I am a figural artist, I love the human body, it's just so beautiful and expressive, um, but I know it best from the female perspective, so I tend to do more women, and I uh, had to work hard to remember to include the guys. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say too, Jerusha's work is all along the back wall if anyone needs to make a pivot. Yeah, and having said that, now I'm looking and I realize, well, I swung the other direction and I have, you know, four guys there. <laughs> but um, it, it's, it's when, when you see a male appear in my work, it's actually a more conscious decision because my default is the female form. Um, I'll say a few things. <clears throat> I'm really interested in storytelling and how um, stories are passed from generation to generation. And um, men and women are both, of course, storytellers. But in my world, um, it's my mother who is the storyteller. And so um, I also am not sure that when I'm in my studio making that I'm necessarily thinking about making a statement about being a woman, um, maybe it's a subconscious thing, but I do know that it, um, I am, I'm really proud to be here, and um, my grandmother is an artist, and so from a very young age, I saw her as a role model that I could also make things, so I'm just thankful for that. So now it's no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to say something, because um, the place that I came from, it's, I hate to say that, and all my Iranian friends, they always ask me to don't say these things, and I'm like, okay, I'm not, but I'm gonna say that, because I think <laughs> women in Iran is like um, women here in 70s, not 2020, and men are like, whew, 2000. I don't know, 40, so that's why I'm always, that's why women's situation became, uh, not women's situation, totally the, my gender became so important to me because I always wanted to um, get my rights, do what I wanted to do, which I couldn't, I couldn't do everything, <laughs> and so um, that's why all these women that I lived with them, they remained in my mind and they became uh, part of my work. I cannot stop thinking about their life situation. I cannot stop thinking about them. So all of my works based on their life stories. And, and I think I, I've, I feel lucky and I am happy that I'm here and I, I, I can talk about those stories and those women. Um, for Jerusha and Sanaz, I think because you make figurative work, and that maybe this is my own leaning, but it seems like you have work that really bears witness or you're portraying people that have kind of bore witness to certain cultural mov moments or movements um, and I'm interested if you feel, I'm interested between the divide of kind of making figurative work and if there's any pressure of portraying a person versus leaving a person out of your work, because then I think there's no pressure to kind of be generous. But I think when you're putting people up on the wall, you have to be conscious. Um, I... I mean, I think representation is important, and um, like I said, I just think that the human figure is the most beautiful 
thing ever. And um, as, a, as a black artist, if I want to see black folks represented in these spaces and other spaces, um, visually represented, I should say, then, and I love making or drawing the human figure, why not be that person putting them up? Now there's, there's also um, the power of what's not shown or editing, which I do um, edit these down to single or maybe two people in the frame because I want you to connect personally in an intimate way with each individual figure uh, versus um, creating large scenes of things that are happening. It's a, it's a conscious decision um, to try and get you to have a moment, specific moment with each uh, figure. And um, where I set them is also important. So this particular series, all of the figures are in this um, sea of water that represents our, our society. We're all floating in the same soup. And um, so that's important, but I've also whittled out everything else. You can't look at that and say they're in the South or uh, in Paris or, you know. There's no kind of markers of location. Yes. Yeah. Um, about my work, I, I think I'm kind of uh, introducing my culture, introducing that the place that I grew up and um, any of my, I say that um, again, all of my Iranian friends, when they see my works, they're like, everything is so familiar with for them, it's like they make connections so easily. Like the visual them. language is so quick for exactly. them. Yeah, yeah. And but for my other uh, viewers, I need to talk and I need to like um, write more and introduce. Like and teach them through the work a little bit. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why I started to make um, like these figures, like this space or. And actually, the portrait, I made them first, but I was thinking about to make these figures before make the portraits, but I had um, some idea and I made them and then I learned how to make a paper and make these figures and um, again, I think all, all of my books about maybe um, introducing myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know you just said you have to teach non-Iranian viewers through the work, but I was wondering if you would do just that actually for the work that's right over here. Um, because I think, I think it's, under, I think it's um, understandable for many people, but I think when you explained it in your studio, it was so much crisper. Mm -hmm. If you wouldn't mind walking us through. Uh, um, about this piece, I... Mm, I, I was thinking of, to make this piece for maybe more than four years, but I, I, uh, could, I made some like figures with fabric, I made some really small like ceramic pieces, but I didn't like them because I wanted something um, so personal and something that I can make some connection with my character that I have them in my mind. So, and then when I, when I learned how to make pa uh, handmade paper, I realized that, okay, now I can use the actual, like the veil, we call it, in Iran, we call it chador. So the material, the fiber is um, chador. I asked uh, my mom, she collected the prayer um, used Chador and she sent them to me and then I make this paper and then I make the chador with the paper again so and now I think 
that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. That's, and for know. those who don't know, the chador is the black cloak worn frequently by women in Iran. And all these figures down here are kind of all small figures. Um, Imi isn't here. Imi Huangbo is our other artist, but she couldn't be here tonight. Um, but she said a really beautiful metaphor about kind of how she, when she's making her work, which is in this back corner, it feels like she's doing synchronized diving. <laughs> and Lucha, you also said it felt like you were doing surgery. Um, and because y'all work in paper, I think the saying of measure twice, cut once is really like painfully real in your everyday practice. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in kind of, first of all, how many times do you just say like, screw it, I'm scrapping this piece, it's, it's irrecoverable, but also how intuitive do you allow your work to be? Because I would imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it would have to be pretty intentional because there's no going back. So with these knife drawings, each one of them has more than 10,000 superficial cuts to redirect the light. And of course, most of them, I just trash them. I edit myself so much. And it could take me like three months just to get one right. And it's such a beautiful process of just, because I'm collaborating with paper, it's not so much as I'm imposing over it and just going through the surface. It's more about understanding that Western paper has this beautiful quality of bouncing off the light that other papers don't, that just sort of hold the light. And you can see them in paper lanterns and things like that. So it's actually having that perfect relationship between the right paper and the perfect sharp blade but it's mostly just you know human power it's like the willingness of making it work and i already made the commitment of making this technique because i'm going for the power of small actions and how it's able to make change and transform and the only way to do it it's to actually go through the process myself of having this slow change of the paper and the way it's moving with the light and creating different shades of the same color. So in order to understand slow change, it's, um, it's the process has to fit with it too. And because you, you want change to happen quickly, right? And it's not always there when people need it. It, that's not the way, the realistic way for change to happen. It happens at different stages and it takes a really long time. And sometimes people lose faith before the change happens, which is really sad. So I'm trying to keep hope, you know, and then it could be a month and then I just have a little bit of it done and it's fine because I'm always going to be cutting paper anyway. So just make the commitment. We can do anything. Um, my dining room became uh, my studio space to work on, on my zoetrope, which is um, seen here. It's an early animation machine. And I realized that every Monday, uh, my children's piano teacher would come in and look over and think, what in the world oh, is God. she doing? <laughs> because, of course, it's so much... Um, just experimentation. And um, I started with, I think, 32 figures, and then it got smaller and smaller. Um, I think that part of uh, making is so much about just being OK with having little failures and, and just continuing to, to keep experimenting and to keep, um, to keep working. Um, I think that those those are the times where magic can sort of happen um, in your work. Um, in terms of sewing with paper, um, it was one of those things where it's like, well, here we go. Like, um, this is going to go through the sewing machine, and I hope this, hope this scene is right. It's either or it's great. <laughs> right. yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's one of the wonderful things about being a maker is uh, having this imaginative time where, where there are 
so many possibilities and then editing down and editing down and just having the faith that um, your vision and, and the inspiration and the concept is, is gonna um, see its way through. Um, I, I love making works I'm like I feel I'm addicted to it so I don't mind everything I don't mind everything goes to my mind I'm, I make it and I well, and especially these works you said you just crank them out as many as you possibly can yeah I think I have I have about maybe more than 500 figures and I'm sure that hundred of them they are not good and believe me so but the good thing is because I can like just soak them and print something on them or make something else with them. So um, I don't mind if I fail. I don't, I think by making work, I like uh, experience something and I um, can improve my skills and maybe my visual um, view to make better work. So. Did I answer? Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for my pieces, I spend a lot of time up front doing bunches of sketches and refining those before the sketch that I choose to use ends up getting transferred to the back of the paper. So that's kind of my guide. And then um, I do some small editing as I'm cutting. Um, again, whittling down, refining, do I really need uh, that tiny detail there? Is it going to read? You know, those kinds of things. Um, and the upfront work tends to help <laughs> cut back on me having to start, o you know, start, cut cut scrap back. it uh -huh. and start over. Um, yeah, sometimes the blade slips and then you find a new shape to cut, but uh, for the most part, I'm, I'm doing most of the editing in the um, sketching and, and process. <laughs> um, I'm interested as well. I think, especially Whitney and Lucia, you probably have to kind of fight against people thinking your work is precious. Um, and I'm interested for everyone, but especially you two, if there's any moments where you felt that your work has been like wildly misunderstood or you've had to backtrack or have to over explain and kind of been like, why can't you just lean in a little harder? I'm interested. I think there's always going to be some sort of criticism, whether you are too rough with the materials or you, you're just making something that it's completely precious. But um, I really had to do this technique for what I wanted to convey, and actually implementing now the shape of the papagayo, which are Venezuelan kites specifically, do refer to this sort of um, fight and symbol that we have nowadays in Venezuela. The papagayos are used to uh, more as banners now, instead of just flying them as toys. Now you make a kite not to fly, but you know, have the lettering, have your message on them. And um, I really had to make this body of work with this technique that took a really long time and that the lines were done in such a way that you have one common color and then the divisions between those two shades are done because of the perspective, of the different perspective of two sides. And that was very important for me, you know, once I developed the language for it, now I could do it and I could build it. So there's a lot of strength in the work uh, that, and I wanted to make this sort of badge of honor. And it does, it could be seen more as embroidery or, or something like that, but it's done with a knife and you can't go back with a knife. It's just, you make that cut and it's done and it's part of our history and culture. And um, so it is both sort of aggressive and precious because it's part of what we are and who we are in Venezuela. 
Yes, and my name is Fight Two in Spanish. So I, am, I, I can be very aggressive with paper. <laughs> um, I'm very conscious of the um, sort of visual preciousness of the work that I'm making. I'm very much trying to um, tap into uh, storybook imagery and um, images of children's books from the 1950s. Um, so I'm really trying to pull you in with the um, simplicity of the image and um, the simpleness in some ways and then I'm asking you to stay a little bit longer and explore ideas of hope and loss and the absent center and um, so I, I kind of I'm okay if people think that it's precious I just hope that they'll stay a little bit longer and realize that there's a lot more to the work And for you too, I don't think misinterpretation of preciousness is so much an issue, but I am still interested if you feel your work has been kind of wildly misinterpreted or that you've been misunderstood throughout your practice. The answer can also be no. <laughs> um, I, I don't know about misunderstood. I, I, my work I'm hoping that you connect to it just as one human encountering the image of another human being so a kind of recognition yeah with another yeah um, that's, that's the short answer no no that's great um, about my work I I heard that comment that they are sad and that comment honestly make me sad because I don't want to make sad work. I just want to mm, talk about something. But I um, had some people not he, not for this exhibition, for another one that they cried and they told me, "Hey, we cried and we left." And I was like, "I actually I think I kind of like I I hated they cried, but I thought okay, I need to like." Um, I don't know, like change, make something, make some changes to Well, like if they're reading it that way and you didn't want them to cry, like yeah. what, does something need to change? Does your work need to change? Or have they just read it wrong? I would imagine that's a tricky line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, um, that's one of the um, things that I, um, I still thinking about that, that I want to, uh, I'm trying to change it, and I just want to tell the story, and I don't want make anyone like um, to be sorry about that. It's just um, something that happened in some part of the world, and um, so many people are trying to change that situation, and I'm sure that that's going to change soon. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's a compliment that they cried, actually. I mean, I think that the, there was real empathy there. I do, too. I know there. it's not what you want, yeah. but it seems, at least it resonated in some way, which I think is the goal of most people making work. Um, when you mentioned that, it made me think, um, actually, at the opening reception, someone said, oh, your, your figures are so angry. And, you know, it, was, it came as a surprise to me uh, that they're ang or that they read them as angry, um, but if that's your, you know, if I I feel like once you make the work, you can't fully control the the mental space or the baggage or the experiences that people are bringing to the work. Um, in terms of intention, no, I wasn't trying to create angry folks. I mean, some of them are struggling, and there is uh, tension with their environment, but um, I don't think of them as, as angry. But I'm also okay if that's where you're coming at, if that's how you connect to them. Well, I think for kind of like the two sets, I think kind of heavy and sincere work doesn't necessarily have to be angry or sad. And then kind of work that visually is perhaps more delicate doesn't mean it's um, like sickly sweet. I think that's a big misinterpretation. And of course, everyone can tell I'm obsessed with gender. But I think that's, I think that's because 
you're, I think it's because you're women artists and people are really quick to say, oh, of course, I understand. You make pink work. Because you're a girl, I get it, like I understand. Um, I wanted to say two things as well. One, I'm sure you've all figured this out, but we'll take questions at the end. And two, I'm gonna ask you all to ask one of your fellow artists a question. It doesn't have to be serious. You can ask about what they bought at the grocery store. Um, but I'm kind of interested in the group dynamic you've developed throughout the show. Um, and one of my final questions, I think it's really important to give artists credit that you can't necessarily, the art world is, I wish it was more sustainable for everyone, but you have to have side gigs and you have to have side hustles. And you're all very smart ladies and all are in academia and teaching. Um, and I'm interested as if that came to you on purpose, if you needed a job. Also, if your superintendent is here, you can lie. <laughs> it's fine, <laughs> that's fine. I will it's let, I'll let it ride. Um, but I'm interested if your teaching practice has any correlation with your work or any correlation with your personal practice. Well, to me, I started in the graphic design world, so I don't think without that perspective of being a graphic designer, I could make what I make today. Uh, but, you know, mostly I just, you know, you have to follow what the client wants, and I needed something where I could be my own client and raise my own questions and be happy about that and really feel the empowerment of using whatever materials I wanted and talk about whatever it is that I wanted instead of following a design brief. But um, anything that's still creative and keeps me going, I'll, I'll go for it because this is my life really. Making art every day, that's what I want to do. And if I have to do graphic design or teach or have whatever side hustle, it's, it's fine because at the end of the day, I feel myself as an artist and only an artist. Um, I have been um, at a private school called Heritage Preparatory School for the last 10 years. And it is a classical school, which I did not know what I was getting myself into when what I accepted this. I'll tell you. <laughs> So in the art room, we are studying, say we're studying Impressionism. The students are also in study, studying Impressionism in, in their history class or in literature, so they understand context in a way that I certainly didn't, you know, as a child. Um, and so I have found myself really learning as a teacher, um, learning more about Caravaggio or learning about the Egyptians and papyrus paper. Um, so I feel really thankful that I'm able to teach um, and also make work. Um, so yeah, I, I, just, I kind of see myself doing this for the long haul. Um. I personally love teaching. I enjoy spending time with uh, spending uh, time with the students and uh, share my uh, skills and also learn from them because I think it's not just me to teach something they teach me every day I, I learn from them every day so um, the teaching is like one of my favorite things in the world and also um, I'm a designer, I'm a graphic designer too, so um, I design um, and I love that because I've worked um, as a designer for a long time in my country and now it's, it's like part of my life. I cannot um, design, like I cannot stop designing like logos or something. All of my friends, when I ask, I'm like, I'm there, even for free. Yeah. I will do that. <laughs> Start a <laughs> yeah. so do the logo. Yeah. We're still talking about our side hustles? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It will never end. <laughs> um, so I am working at a museum now, um, the Paper Museum. Convenient. Like the best job ever. Um, and I, I feel like, I mean, I have to do it, but I, 
I feel like I would still be either working or teaching in addition to studio because I get really sad when I'm just in the studio by myself all the time. Like I need that interaction and it feeds my um, creativity. So before the, I worked for the museum, I taught a lot of different uh, schools and uh, community centers and, and um, the, the, I bet you if you ask any of the people that I taught, my favorite question is why? So, um, why? Yeah, so you painted that black, why? Or you have no color in the picture, why? Um, and then to hear the answers, and then my second favorite thing is what if? And that, those conversations you can't have alone in your studio, like you need to be able to bounce things off with other people. Um, so I find that I, I want the balance of that uh, interacting and pushing myself, being able to, or, or, or not pushing myself, but interactions with other people push me. So I'm approaching it this way, and then you, you know, at the paper museum, we have our homeschoolers come in, and they t completely, 180, whatever you thought was going to happen at that day in the classroom, it's like, oh, it never occurred to me to even, to, to think to turn that upside down or to rip that in half or whatever. And it, so then it kind of help inform new places to start when you go to your studio. Okay, now you're all on the spot and you can plead the fifth if you need to, but I was interested if any of you have questions for one another that you haven't been able to ask throughout the process or comments about the work. I wanted to ask Lucha, how did you install this? And even, how did this come about like visually as like a, the first idea? Well, this piece is based off of the knife drawings that are next to them. I usually do um, paper installations and framed works. For the past five years, I've been working more with the frameworks. And for this exhibition, I wanted to create something new that was a wall piece that would relate to whatever the knife drawings were doing and that idea of playing with, with light. And these, uh, these are a repetition of the um, same shape of a circle, actually. So, so you see the front and back, front and back, and that creates uh, the idea of a line and then eventually the idea of a structure. And it's also about you have this sort of seeming ordered structure, but then once you put light on it, you see new lines, new divisions, and also resistance and then you see again the the symbol of the papagayo simplified so even in structures that should be the same and then you work all be the behind the scenes where the color is and you see when the light is sh you know shining on them it reveals another boundary and then it also relates to the idea that you know from a distance it could be the same shape the same grid, the same system, but an invitation doesn't mean that you're truly welcomed, and there's so many different lines in between. And I really wanted to use light the same way I use it with the knife drawings, sort of to activate another truth and another perspective. And I just use staples. <laughs> <laughs> And I wanted to ask um, Whitney, um, could you share a favorite story that you have from your mother or that could be, or like a little remark because there's so many of them, but I just wanted to know if you had like a favorite one. No, actually she's not here. Where are, yeah, she should be here. Raise um, your hand if you're. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my mother um, used humor to um, get through a sort of a difficult childhood, and I think that um, I think all of our childhoods are wonderful because they're childhood, and I think that um, 
sometimes we don't need to know all the details. Um, I actually didn't know about sort of the truth of her childhood until I was an adult, which was that um, her father had gone to prison for laundering money. And um, all of a sudden, all of these really kind of funny stories made sense because it was, oh, he wasn't there. That's why you were working in yeah, the bakery. Yeah, the code word became That's what, clear. Yes. Um, but uh, one of the stories that I thought was hilarious and wonderful and tragic was she went to prison to visit her father and um, her car had an expired tag and the car didn't, also did not go in reverse. And so she tells this story. <laughs> of her father I guess came she could see him she was waving she was pushing her car oh, and wait. there was a security card coming by and she was terrified that he was going to give her a ticket of course we know she was probably 16 so she yeah. didn't realize security guards don't give tickets but she's pushing this car waving at her dad trying to kind of block the the expired tag and I made a painting about that and uh, it's really meaningful to me and funny and tragic and so <laughs> No pressure. We are, no. we are welcome to take questions from the crowd. So I had a, a question for Sanaz. I know that when I came to drop my work off, they said that you had arranged this and then you came back and you, um, you, know, you were kind of playing with how to arrange it in the space. So um, maybe could you tell us about some of the other iterations or how did you finally decide on this arrangement? That's a good, um, really good question because my first idea was to like the piece go up, come down, go down and go up again. It's like continuously because it's like 70, it's about 72 feet. And, uh, but because of the space that I had, I needed to like uh, think about something else. And I had this piece in another place, which was, um, okay, I'm gonna tell you something else. So when I hang it, I, I went to that corner and I saw that maybe it's just me and but anyway because of the round shape on the floor and the hanging piece I realized that this is another form of the maybe like some kind of abstract form of women with the veil and I didn't touch it anymore I liked it and I okay I enjoy it so I kept it like that <laughs> yeah it's accidentally happened that things but I liked it. That's um, something about my work. I like make something and then the rest of things just accidentally happen. I arrange them, I move them around, and then um, I move them and I move them until I like the way that I arrange it. Yeah. I think sometimes you have to get to a point, and I think anyone who makes anything can relate, you have to get to a point where you say, that's fine. <laughs> That's good enough. That'll work for now. Well, thank you, ladies. You've been very generous. Thank you so much. I wanted to turn it over to the crowd, too. I'm not sure what time it is, but I'm sure we have time for questions. Um, if anyone has any burning questions, please raise your hand, and I'll bring you a mic. <laughs> I'm curious about the relationship between the small figures and this shape. I haven't seen, the, I haven't really looked. I just ran in and sat down, but maybe you can talk about that as well as the figures. Uh, sorry, let me say, I don't know if y'all heard. She said she was interested in kind of, actually, I'll leave you the mic, of course. Um, she's interested in the corresponding nature between this large shape and the smaller figures. Well, I'm done. Oh, well, yeah, OK. Um, the whole idea, I saw a photo. I saw a photo that 
like some women with the whale or with chador next to the waterfall and they were wet, they were like enjoying their moment but with these heavy dark things and it, that photo remained in my mind. So I started to make these small figures and I had some another piece in my studio and I started to play with the, with the other piece and then I remember that photo and I thought how if I make like the uh, waterfall what, uh, but not like clear, like black. And so that's the first idea and then so many different things like so many like um, iconic culture that I use like the and then, okay, like one of them is like the destiny, like they, um, they learn us as a little girl that we don't have any choice. Like our life is planned and we just need to follow a path and that's our destiny. So that's another thing that I try to put in my work. And also, um, the red color, the, it has two, the, the piece is two-sided. One side is black, the other side is red. So I usually use red color and I try to hide it on some of my work, not the other one. Because red color is like, is um, maybe political color or it's forbidden for uh, women to use in public places. So there is no rule, they don't say it, but if you wear it, they can arrest it. They can, like, I don't know, find some reason and, you know, arrest you. So, and then that's another reason that I use red color. And I can talk about it, like, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Did I answer your question? Yeah, good. <laughs> You ladies are all fairly young, um, and I'm sure that your vision has changed from the time that you started as an artist until now. Um, think 15 years in front, and uh, do you visualize that you will be doing the same type of art, or do you think you will be doing something different? Years, 15 years from now, that's your question. Oh, goodness, do you want to take this, Lucha? <laughs> um, I know that I will still be a maker for sure. Um, I'm not sure if the work will be paper or fabric or filmmaking. I imagine I will be making films. Um, I love to collaborate with my husband on um, installations. So uh, that's what I think I'll be doing. If I'm still alive, um, <laughs> I, I, would, I would do whatever my body allows me to do and just try to express myself and I don't think it's going to be the same thing because I'm always questioning myself, always pushing the work forward and trying to find new ways of saying what needs to be said at that specific moment. And I don't think I'll be able to make knife drawings for a really long time because of arthritis and all of that. So, but um, I'll be definitely still making art because that's who I am. But it's definitely going to be something else. I can't wait to see it. Now I, I'm, I'm just trying to imagine it. Um, I think I'm, I will make more works but and I'm sure that I because I am I, I think I'm a printmaker so I will work with paper more and more but I don't know if I am gonna make the same things I mean I I'm sure that it's gonna change and yeah but I hope that and I wish that I can have that situation that I make more works more art and I can talk about my work 
Well, I'm a printmaker and fiber artist, and so I know I'll, like she said, be continuing to work in paper and with textiles. Um, but as far as this work, I'm already kind of um, wanting to play with the idea of pop-ups, doing folios, um, which was, I was really excited to see you with the zoetrope and how, introducing that motion. So trying to figure out ways to incorporate some um, movement in the work, but small, small movements little surprises, intimate things, and then trying to figure out how can you make something that requires the interaction of the viewer and have it live up or, you know, withstand multiple handlings. So that's what I'm trying to figure out now. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to just highlight the, um, how much joy there is in camaraderie and being able to um, hang out with other talented folks that are passionate about the same material. So like we're talking like, how did you hang that? How did, you know, getting some of those little um, things that they've worked out through trial and error, you may be able to, I, may, I might try that technique, but also feeling really supported in terms of the uh, committee and the um, museum staff. Like, it's, it means a lot to uh, have folks that invest their time and energy in helping you share your work with a larger audience. I think it's, it's truly an honor. Look at all these amazing artists sitting next to me and also Amy Huangbo, who's not uh, here today with us, but um, just having a supported team behind us, you know, just to continue our work, to say, you know, just make more work, we'll give you this space to just share it with more people. And we had a lovely opening reception. We had um, around, what, 300 people come and see your work. And also being able to talk about it amongst ourselves and also the different situations to do it, you know, for print media, through radio, that has been amazing. And for me, it's such an honor to represent the Georgia Committee as the state in Washington, D.C. for the National Museum of Women in the Arts exhibition that um, it feels more of an international representation as well because you don't only have states uh, here in North America, but also from Europe and from South America. And you don't get to do that every day. So I feel so supported and I, you know, I can't wait to make more work. Sometimes you're in the studio and you're in solitude, you're just making and you don't know if people are going to ever see your work. And that can be very frustrating. It's a delicate space to be a creative and to keep that fire inside of you. Um, sometimes when you don't get shows, then it just dims a little bit. And with opportunities like this, 
you just you know it just grows more and more and you want to make more art every day all the time and that's what you want as a community to support your artists because without you what do we have we just have these frames it does it doesn't become art when if people don't experience it and don't start asking questions what am i looking at can we talk about it with the artists and also amongst yourself it's just such an honor to be here and even right now just looking at this beautiful crowd i'm just so humbled by being that you're interested in listening to what we have to do um i think as many many of you know that this is actually the last exhibition in this space, um, which is really, this space is amazing, is it not? Um, so I think that we were so thrilled to be here, and um, MOCA's staff was wonderful in, in installing, and it was really in, just an honor to work with you and Michael Rooks, and um, uh, the committee's just been so supportive, and um, many of you were able to see the documentaries that they made about us and our and our practice and that's something that we will be able to take with us forever and um, it's really what an incredible gift um, so this has been a, a great um, honor for me and thank you um, I personally feel lucky to be part of this talented amazing artist and also work with uh, um, these professional people that encouraged me, supported me, and uh, make, made me to work harder, and um, it was just amazing opportunity for me, and I want to thank you all for this, and um, it was amazing, and it's amazing. It's a beautiful feeling that you being seen and uh, other people hear your voice. Thank you. I think that's a good place to close. I want to give a final. <laughs> Well, the Georgia Committee just wants to thank Carson and the artists for being here tonight. Your generosity and sharing yourself and your practices have been tremendous. And it has been such a pleasure to be able to be a part of this experience with y'all. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all.